Welcome to Dream Farm. Jordan and I were going to do a whole farm update and really go over all the projects, food plots, habitat related on the farm. And it just, when we started thinking about the immensity of that, it just was too, too big of an episode. So we're going to break it up. This one's going to be the habitat projects and describing a little bit of the, of the reasons for these projects, but really focusing on updates, how they're doing. And then we'll have another one uh, that you can find here on the channel too on Dream Farm that's an update of the food plots. So here we stand. Uh, I have PTSD from this hillside. Yeah, I mean, I had ulnar nerve damage. Did you have ulnar nerve damage? Dream Farm is brought to you by Whitetail Institute. Research equals results. Hunt Stand Pro Whitetail App. Hoyt Archery. Wildlife Farming. And PH Outdoors. I don't think so. <laughs> well, not that's sure. not something to brag about. <laughs> no, I mean I couldn't. I couldn't get like my little finger to join the rest of my hand for like three or four months after that. Uh, I pinched. Somehow through it, through it all, I'm sure running that stupid auger, I pinched my ulnar nerve. Um, so so don't hit me up on how to fix that. I do know how to fix it now, though I think. Um, but there's got to be somebody better than me. Okay, that aside, we did a lot of work. Uh, we spent planting trees. Yes. You missed that part. Yeah, planting trees. Yeah, not just getting injured. But yeah, I think it was, what did we figure we had seven days? I think it was even more. I think it was eight or nine. Because you did a couple more. Af I think I did seven or eight, and then you did yeah. a couple more after that. Yeah, we ended up putting 4,500 trees in the ground. Uh, some of them were, uh, you know, we did what the, um, what do you call that steel thing that you push into the ground? Uh, something bar, di dibble bar. <laughs> Some of them we did with the dibble bar. Most of those were uh, uh, the wild plum. But everything else we ran the auger. You know, whether it was Ben with the skid steer, he drilled a thousand holes for us to put uh, hybrid willow trees in. And we'll take a look at the progress we've had there too. But the rest of it was all done with the hand auger. A modified ice fishing auger. <laughs> Yeah, I can't believe it drilled that many holes. Um, but anyway, let's let's get past um, what we did and how the why uh, obvious because we've got a lot of pasture here and the slopes were too steep to get any kind of equipment on here. So we had to hand plant a bunch of it. So if this was going to be something other than cattle pasture, uh, we had to kind of help Mother Nature along. We. Uh, the entire project, and you'll have to, rem I'm going to let Jordan chime in too, but this, the stuff we planted, um, I'll let you take a crack at it and then I'll try to remember. Red osier dogwood, wild plum, hybrid willow, nine bark, hickory, no, nope. or chestnut? No. Nope. Hazelnut? Yes. Hazelnut. Um, uh, cherry, choke cherry? Choke cherry. Uh, oak. Yes. What kind? White and swamp white. That's eight, I think. Yeah, that might have been everything we did. Yeah. I don't think we did anything else. The purpose was to put things in here that were wildlife friendly. The, Are those all native to this area? Uh, I don't know. I've found, I haven't found any wild nine bark on the farm. I've found quite a bit of naturally occurring wild hazelnut, believe it or not. Um, obviously the oaks. Hybrid willow is not native, but uh, we might as well start there. We'll talk about the hybrid willow really quick. The purpose of that was not so much for habitat, but to create screens along the lanes that we use for coming and going through this part of the farm. Because it's pretty open. And we've said before, when, uh, especially when all the leaves are off, the deer that bed on these slopes, they can see just right down through all of the valleys because it, there's nothing really protecting us after the leaves are off the trees and bushes so that was kind of the yeah. thought process yeah and they're doing well 
uh, as well as can be expected, deer like to eat hybrid willow. So we were pretty good about not exposing those trees by opening up the grass. We put in probably foot long, rooted uh, pieces of, of trunk or branch or whatever it is, but they were rooted. And almost all of them have put out trees. Some of the trees are five or six feet tall already after one year, and some of them are very, very short. Uh, some of them the deer found. I'd say 25% of them or less maybe the deer have found and really worked on. The rest of them are just hidden in the grass and working their way up through. So I think we got lucky with the hybrid willow. Uh, I think we got most of them past the deer, so we'll see what next year brings. It's going to be a long time before we have a really effective screen here, but at least we're off to a good start. Mm -hmm. And like you've said before also, the, those grow faster than most other varieties, mm -hmm. which was kind of the, the reasoning behind plant, planting those specific trees. Yeah, they're supposed to be five or six feet a year. So we'll, we'll keep watching those and we'll keep updating over the coming years on those. Uh, so let's look at what we did here. And, and overall, I mean, rather than going into each of the individual plantings, let's just say they all did well. Because it was about as ideal of growing conditions as you could ask for. I mean, across the whole farm, probably across the whole part of the state, everything is green, everything is thick and lush, and it's a completely night and day difference between last year's extreme mm -hmm. drought conditions. I mean, this was a pretty wet spring, probably more wet than the standard year, right? Yeah, the spring, yeah, the, and, and, and yeah, I in think the so. summer too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so it they got off to a good start and then they didn't really have anything working against them. No, if anything, we've seen a little bit of, of too much moisture stress on the plum because um, they're starting to turn yellow and red. And mm -hmm. I looked that up online and it's moisture stress. <laughs> so believe it or not, they're, they've got too much moisture, but the rest of it's doing really well. We lost a very, very few of these rooted shrubs. And the one that uh, jumped out at us, we were more, most nervous about or the uh, hazelnut and the reason being the roots were so big on those that we had to do a lot of pruning of the roots just to get them down into the hole mm -hmm. you know and I think in hindsight if we'd had a slightly bigger auger uh, on that ice fishing auger setup that I had <laughs> I think that we probably could have been a little bit better there but we only had a four inch uh, diameter auger and some of those root clusters were a foot and a half in diameter. So we pruned some of those back mm -hmm. quite extensively. I mean, I yeah. think when we started, we're all, oh, we'll just take care of them, like only take off like a yeah. little bit by the end of like the eighth day. We're like, just chop it all off, just put the yeah. tree in the ground, do whatever's fastest. So that doesn't really surprise me. I am kind of surprised that they did as well as they did, given mm -hmm. how merciless we were yeah. clipping and those roots. We were, we were lucky with the amount of moisture we got, I think, mm -hmm. there. But even the first ones we put in, there was so much root that we pushed down in there that it was hard to put dirt in. So we had a lot of air pockets. Yeah, and the trees just kind of stuck up above yeah. the ground. The roots and, roots and all. <laughs> but they all, not all, but almost all of them survived. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I'd say, if you're doing the hazelnut, uh, you know, if you get anything that looks at all like what we got, either you have to use a, a spade, you know, a shovel, or you got to use a really large diameter auger to make a lot bigger hole um, on a normal year, give the roots some room. Mm -hmm. But we got lucky and we could cut them back pretty hard and, and still get them to grow. Everything else just went like clockwork. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're showing you, you know, through the course of this, uh, some of the other stuff that we planted and how it looks. And uh, we didn't have anything that, you know, showed any signs of failure. Mm -hmm. So. And everything is not just like surviving, but doing well, shooting off new branches, shooting off new leaves, yeah. like really flourishing. And I'm sure you'll get to it, but same with the direct seeding. Mm -hmm. All of those, the ones that we planted in the October 23 versus the ones that we planted in October 22 or November 22, the November 22 ones, they kind of, eh, they just trickled along. But the ones from 23, I mean, they look like mini little trees they've got three four layers of leaves stacked on them yeah yep so and, and we'll do more we'll get into more detail on those in, in just a bit but uh so that wraps up the the bare rootstock 
Um, again, we had a lot of species, a lot of variety here. And one of the things we, we maybe should comment on is uh, the fact that we did not create a release for these plants after we planted them. Uh, we let the grass come around them. And there was a little method to that madness. Uh, we got lucky again because of the moisture because all this grass would have sucked up a lot of moisture if we hadn't had all that rain. Mm -hmm. But it was to hide them from the deer. I mean, that's what it was all about is, you know, we don't want the deer, it's for the deer, but they've got to let it get some age before they start to hammer it. Short term loss, long term gain. Yeah. Just need them to understand basic economics honestly. yeah i think they're getting it yeah they're not stupid they're learning yeah so that's uh that's why we have to fight through the grass to show you all this stuff um it's because you know we did that on purpose so the deer wouldn't find it very easily um, overall success rate 9.9 .9 out of a 10 uh, as we rate our bare root stock olympic gold medal in bare root stock yeah for this season yeah and, and uh we'll be doing like maybe a parade in New York City or something to, to celebrate our Olympic medal here. So now we're gonna talk about the direct nut seeding project. And that's just a fancy term of saying uh, planting acorns. By hand. Jordan knows that part pretty well. She's I'm always quick to point out how hard she had to work, poor young lady. I've put, I've put some muscle power into this place. You've sweat a little bit here. Maybe some tears. <laughs> Can't confirm or deny. Uh, yeah, but we had success with it in uh, the 2023 planting year, which was the uh, 2024 summer growing season, which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. But the stuff we planted in 22 didn't do as well. Uh, I think it was limited because the seed went into the ground and then it froze like a day or two later. Maybe that was an issue, I don't know. Um, maybe the seed was not quite as good, that I don't know. But for sure the drought of 23 didn't help. The conditions were perfect for the stuff we planted in, in 23 that we transitioned into now 24 with the growing season. Um, and it, and it's, you can go back and watch the episode, we'll put a link in the description to go back and watch the episode where we talk about planting. And, you know, I don't really wanna go back over all of the steps. You know, you create a seed bed, you spread the seed, you, you know, disc it in, etc. But now we're facing the weed control part. And, you know, the update is, is gonna be more about, uh, yeah, they're all over the place, tons of little oak trees, but as wet as it's been, the weeds are really an issue too. So I've found a few chemicals that you can spray that do help with that. Uh, I, I found, uh, I can kill thistles and a number of the broad leaves with triclear, no, uh, dang it. I forgot the name of the active ingredient, but the chemical itself is called Sonora and it's got a active ingredient that I'm sure you'll find in other chemicals too. That did a decent job on clearing out some of the broad leaves. Then you can use clethodim to kill the grasses uh, without killing the trees. But then I got really frustrated and I've got a spot that we're standing in right now that I want to show you just for fun. And I just sprayed it with Roundup. Uh, I, th I think the part of me said these trees can handle some Roundup. Uh, so I hit this with a full rate. Well, almost full rate, quart and a half per acre uh, rate. And it wiped out all the weeds and it burned the oak trees, but I don't think it killed them. You know, it's been three weeks now. Everything else is dead, but you know, some of these oak trees are showing you know, where the chemical hit the leaves and burned them. A few of the trees are dead, but this spot was so bad with weeds that it was sort of like, you know, sink or swim because we weren't gonna be able to save these trees any other way than just, you know, something, you know, pretty, pretty intense. Desperate uh, times, desperate measures. That's right. But normally uh, you can do other things other than what I tried here. And, and we'll talk about this more later in the future. And we'll just see if these trees snap out of it and and how this goes, but uh, just know that the second year and the third year, weed control is critical. So we're not out of the woods, so to speak, yet uh, with these little trees, but we're off to a really good start. Anything you want to add about them? I don't think so. Yeah, it's a, uh, well, one more chemical, then we'll, then we'll move on. The 
the pre-emergent that you spray in the springtime before things start to come up is uh, called pendulum. And as long as you hit it pretty hard with that early, you know, to the label rate, then that does buy you a few months into the summer before that wears out and then other stuff starts to come in, other weeds. Question. Yes. Since you wiped everything out of here and we tend to have a thistle issue mm -hmm. on this farm, are you concerned about thistles coming back in now that there's so much open ground? Well, I think we always run into that issue because even if I come in here with the pre-emergent like I'm planning, that might control the thistles to a certain degree, but then when it wears off, you've got all this open ground. Uh, I think thistles are gonna be our nemesis until these trees are three or four feet tall. And then I think they can, they can handle it on their own. Okay, so we're gonna move right along to the next topic. Timber burn is our next topic. We're in the area where uh, below was, was burned in April, above was burned in March. And it seems like, you know, comparing the two, the one that burned a little bit hotter in March seemed to have done a little bit better job overall as we look back on it now from a few months out. Uh, the one thing that I'm seeing here that kind of bums me out, I was really proud of the success that we'd had wiping out so much of the crap that was in there, multiflora rose, prickly ash, gooseberry, um, the the uh, Japanese barberry, that was the main invasive, or those are all, I guess, somewhat invasive, but I'm seeing that now a few of them are starting to come back. Even though they were scorched pretty hot uh, back in March, we're seeing some of them come back from the root. So they didn't kill, it only set them back, you know, pretty, pretty severely. I was hoping that they died. Do you think that if you burn it again next spring, since the plants would be younger, newer, they wouldn't have been growing for years and years, it would have more of an impact on them? Yeah, I think people have even told me that too, that you know, the more, uh, more often you burn it, you know, consistently year on year, that you can wipe out those invasives that way. However, you'd have a harder time getting it to be as hot and as mm -hmm. effective because there's less underbrush and leaves and stuff to burn. That's right. And that's the biggest trade-off, I think. Uh, I do think, and, and I've had either, even people tell me this in the comments that have burned a lot, is that the stuff that, that's uh, good at taking the burn, well adapted to burn, steps in, and that creates the fuel for the future burns. Mm. So you don't have to rely quite as heavily on leaves. You know, there's other plants and weeds and stuff that were adapted to the fire that started to really pick up the pace, then they become the fuel for mm -hmm. future burns. So we'll see. I mean, it's a lot of work. I wish that this stuff wasn't like so much work and like year after year is like, man, to do it well. Uh, it just takes a lot. It's a lot of work. And I was hoping that we could just do this once and be done for two, three years and not have to worry about it again and just wipe that stuff out. Uh, I wasn't quite so lucky, unfortunately. But I'm sure it does a lot of valuable stuff. If, if you look at this now, you'll see that there's still not much of a second layer of underbrush. I mean, we got the canopy and we got the forbs and weeds and, and regrowth coming up along the ground, but that middle layer is gone. Like a lot of those little small trees and, and shrubs and bushes that were taking the sunlight away from the ground are gone. Now when we come back in here and do TSI and open the canopy up, you know, then it should really get a lot of sunlight to the ground and, and really do a nice job of you know, creating uh, forage at the level where the deer live, you know, and not five or six feet up. So that's the burn update. Uh, we have anything left to talk about habitat wise? I think we're going to look TSI. at some TSI and maybe a little bit on the apple trees uh, and then we'll wrap up after that. I was once a part owner of a farm in southern Iowa where there was a tree on the property that the district forester thought would sell at auction for anywhere from twenty-three to twenty-seven thousand dollars. It was a big walnut tree, so we took to calling it the super tree. Uh, I didn't own it when that tree was finally sold. I don't even know if it ever was, but uh, I've got my own version of the super tree, and Jordan's leaning against it. Hey, go easy on the super tree. <laughs> this one is by no means 
a 20 plus thousand dollar tree. It's probably a few thousand dollars. It's a big, beautiful walnut though, straight trunk, uh, long butt log, pretty good diameter. Growing up on the ridge like this, it's gonna grow a little bit slower, so the rings are gonna be tighter. So this tree is probably gonna be worth more to a, you know, a timber buyer than one that was similar size down in a valley. All of this to point out the importance of timber stand improvement for more reasons than just to make the property better for whitetail hunting. One of our priorities when we went through here, uh, Carson Christensen helped me with this cut. We did 27 or 28 acres, I think, on this big ridge complex. I cut a couple Oh, Jordan of trees. cut a few trees too, yeah. Let's not neglect her contribution to that. But one of the things we did was open up the canopy around any of these walnut trees that we found that were, you know, at least average or above average. And sometimes that meant cutting down even small walnut trees or misshapen trees that were nearby. The whole idea is to make the good trees great uh, from a forestry standpoint. From a wildlife standpoint, uh, there's a lot of benefits that you get from TSI. The main one is putting forage at ground level, at nose level, mouth level to the deer versus if you have a mature forest, you know, everything's up high and there's nothing at ground level for the deer to eat. And as you look at this spot, uh, there was a little bit of ground cover here, but I'll bet you we cut 30 trees around the super tree. And you can't see those trees now unless you really start looking. They're here, but they're just completely overgrown with uh, ground level vegetation. And that was the whole point. That was the whole goal. Secondary advantage is it makes the farm thicker, which makes it hunt bigger. And that's kind of an odd concept, but if they can't see you coming and going, uh, let's say a deer can see if 200 yards away in any direction when you're walking, well, that's a quarter of a mile section that they can cover just with their eyes. Well, if they can't see you coming and going, you know, more than just a few yards away because it's so thick, uh, you have a lot more options available to you as far as sneaking in and out. So the farm hunts bigger. That's what we did with TSI. We made the farm hunt bigger. We fed the deer better with more browse. We improved the quality of some of the standing timber that we really selected to, to work around and, and release. And uh, just in general, we improved especially the oak regeneration because oak won't regenerate in the shadows. It likes direct sunlight. So by opening up these areas, uh, we encourage the oak trees to continue to regenerate. And another thing maybe worth noting, and I think you probably are going to, or maybe by the time this comes out, have done an episode about it, uh, government programs can pay for mm -hmm. some of that too, which is kind of nice because, I mean, you want to do it anyway if you're trying to improve a whitetail farm, but the fact that you can get funding for it is kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. And that's a, a big part of what we did here. I mean, this whole effort was through the Conservation Stewardship Program. So they paid for, you know, basically uh, Carson and myself to do this work. And uh, that's nice. I mean, it's a lot of work. It took us a month of cutting just about every day to make it through this this whole area. That's what it's all about here. And, and you know, this is just one pocket, one hole that we made. And we made hundreds of, of spots like this. So that's an update of what it looks like now. I'm impressed. What do you think, Jordan? I mean, it's pretty dang thick. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah, there's a lot of food here. The it's all- Big holes in the canopy, you can mm -hmm. tell. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of sunlight coming in. So it should also increase acorn production in the oak trees that exist. Mm -hmm. Because there's been studies done on that, that if you do the TSI work where you open up the canopy uh, around an oak tree, that tree will be more productive for you know making acorns. So it seems like uh, what we did here really worked out well. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's see. I think we're gonna look at maybe a few apple trees, see what's going on there, and then we'll wrap up. Ew. You? I can't taste good. This one's not too bad. No, I mean, it's probably... Not ripe. Not quite ripe, but it's, it's not bad. So obviously, our final update on the habitat episode is the apple trees. While last year it seemed like every single tree out here had a bunch of apples on it, this year, 
I'd say well under half of the trees have apples. And I've asked a few people about it. Um, the answer I keep getting is the fact that when these trees were flowering, the temperature must have been a little bit cooler, or maybe it was wet that week, and the pollinators just weren't out. So maybe some of these trees flowered at different times than other trees. Uh, I don't think we had any frost in the spring, you know, like a late frost. Mm -mm. I don't think we did. So I think it had to do with just the timing with pollination. So I mean, there's a lot of stuff that has to come together to get a bumper crop of apples, but we still have quite a lot of them. I mean, this tree alone has got, who knows, a couple thousand apples on it. Yesterday I was going out to film a field and I saw a doe standing under, underneath an apple tree. So I know they're, uh, and she was, I'm there, I'm sure she was there for, you know, eating apples that were falling. So uh, they're starting to target the apple trees. Uh, anything that's falling uh, off the trees right now, I'm sure they're eating. Pretty soon when there's thousands and thousands of them falling at once, they wouldn't be able to keep up and it wouldn't really that be that big of a deal. But early season, if you've got an apple tree that's dropping apples, just one more bit of information to key on as you prepare for the season. Not every single apple tree bears apples every year, as we've seen. Uh, it has something to do with the timing of the pollination. So we're going to wrap up the episode right here. Uh, any more thoughts you'd like to add, Jordan? I know she's had enough of looking at fallen trees and all kinds of beans and whatnot. Uh, Black-eyed peas and what other stuff have we looked at today? We've looked at everything. <laughs> No, it's all, it's so cool. It's interesting. Uh, we could discuss the one graft that was successful. Yes, we had a successful graft. Uh, I did probably 30 plus grafts. I haven't looked at them all, but the, of all the ones I've looked at so far, there's only one that's a for sure survivor. So that tells you that if you're trying to hire somebody to come to your orchard and help you out with grafting, uh, don't hire you. Don't don't look in this direction. Well, we appreciate you joining us. We'll see you back here soon for the next episode of Dream Farm. And remember to always dream big. <laughs>